Live. Okay. Um, so I kind of volunteered to set the stage for this workshop today and um, lay some groundwork. And but so I have some slides. They're really more provocations than anything else. Um, some coming from my perspective. Some I've included a lot of quotes that I found from other people who were doing this kind of stuff as a way to provoke the conversation. But I wanted, so I wanna have lots of discussion. Um, that's the first thing I wanna say. But I also wanted to start this before I do anything else. Um, and I wanted to start to just have a conversation about why we do grade before we start talking about why we might not grade. Um, and I don't have a slide for this. This really is, a, I would love to hear people's kind of thoughts about this. Like if we can start making a list in our heads of the reasons why we follow a practice of grading. Like, so does anybody have thoughts about that? Like something they'd like to share? Punish yeah. students for not reading. Punish students for not reading. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I think that's legitimate. But, but yeah. I call it objectivity theater. Objectivity theater. We feel it is how we maintain objectivity in our relationships with our students. What else? Why do we grade? Why is grading a thing? Yeah. Get um, perspective on performance. Yep. So we can. It's a way for us to let students know how they're doing in our class. It's a tool that we use. Beyond that, for other institutions, to know how they right. Their employers. Right. So they have it on their transcript Track. when they apply to grad school, when they apply for jobs. Um, it's like a common thing that we all practice so that we can share that information. Other reasons why we grade. To give uh, honors and awards and stuff like that. Right. So that we have something we can look at when we want to recognize people. Something objective that we can look at. Yeah. Um, scholarships and athletic eligibilities can be based on GPA. Sure, right. So we actually have built into our institution reasons we have to have grades in order for us to position students where we think they need to be or they want to be. Anything else? Yeah. Provide incentive for students. Right. Motivate students. Try and improve. Um, you know, in the discipline that they're that they're learning. Let students know how they're doing. I know there's better yeah. ways, obviously. Right, yeah. yeah. It's a signal yeah. to students, like, right? Otherwise, how is anybody going to know that they're actually learning? If we don't have grades, how do we know we're learning? <laughs> oh, that's a question. <laughs> that's a terrible question. But yeah. Um, anything else? Yeah. You can reward the good students and punish the bad. Mm. Right. Yeah, and that gets back to like what's kind of throwaway when at the beginning there really is this sort of sense that like grades are how we reward and punish. Great, right, like so we actually, as a pro, like not just punishing students, we actually wanna see this as a tool we can use mm -hmm. to, um, to know where to put our energies with working with students. Okay. Um, and programs that have a specific, you know, benchmark for like accreditation and credentialing mm -hmm. purposes. Right, so some, sometimes like we grade because we have to, yeah. because literally there are other parties out there who are looking for grades as a signal um, of something, and if we don't provide that, we can't participate in those relationships the way that we want to. That even extends to just you have to have a certain GPA to graduate from right. State. Right, right. And that's a really good point, is that grading is not just something we do in our classrooms, it's something we do as an institution, right? Grading is part of how we operate as an institution, it's a part of how we signal to students what their role in the institution is, their success in the institution, both while they're here and when they leave. And so we bake it into all kinds of processes. Um, everything to, you can't graduate unless you have met this particular, this hurdle. Yeah? Grading provides a common language between um, other institutions, also careers, internships. Right, it provides us with a common language. As a perfect segue into my very first slide, because now I wanna start talking about all of those reasons, some of which we, we immediately kind of cringed and groaned at, and others were like, well, yeah, that's really a thing. Like, that's a reality that we are facing when it comes to um, students and grades. I want to talk a little bit about why we don't, why we would um, ungrade, why we would try and approach this differently. And most of what I'm about to talk about is comes from my own particular perspective, but like I said, I've tried to... Um, incorporate some voices and quotes from other people as well. But the first one, um, and this is really what got me to a place where I started thinking about ungrading, was that grades are the language we speak with students. Um, and I wanted to change that language. I got to a point where I felt like grades were really the primary way that we were communicating with students about 
who they were in this class and how they were doing in this class. And I just started to feel, for lack of a better word, icky about that. It did not feel like an authentic conversation or authentic language that I was having. Um, but to get to that last point, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. And now you're eating. <laughs> Kayla? Kayla. Kayla. Yeah. As Kayla said. Um, but it really is a language that we, that we have like, collectively decided to speak as a way to understand and measure student success um, and progress. This is a quote from Lisa Lane, a friend and colleague of mine on Twitter. I have had students say to me, I hope you don't think less of me because I did a bad job on this paper. How many of us have heard that or some variation on that from a student? Um, it's always so heartbreaking to me when a student says that as though I'm judging them as a person based on an assignment. Of course I don't. What on earth gave them that idea? Well, years of school where the grade was used to represent them, when someone punished them for poor grades, when they were called a D student. Right, so literally those are the languages, those, that's the language we use to describe and talk about our students. We're all probably guilty of using that language sometimes. It's so baked into our institutions and our practices. <laughs> so that was the first thing for me. Um, and this was also part of that and related to that, that I wanted to start speaking more about learning and less about grades with my students. I didn't want the first thing they said when they came to me to be, so what's my grade? How did I do on this? Like, how, can you tell me what my grade in the class is right now? Like, just this constant coming back to that as though that was the most important conversation we needed to be having. This is a quote from Laura Gibbs. Um, she's at um, University of Oklahoma. She teaches writing almost entirely, oh, not almost, entirely online. And she's actually, this is actually from a book chapter that she's written about ungrading. I explicitly teach students about giving and receiving feedback so that they can give each other helpful feedback, at feedback and also make good use of the feedback they receive. As part of that process, I teach students about growth mindset and the positive value of learning from mistakes. These were the kinds of conversations that I wanted to be fostering and developing in my class. Not conversations about you got a 92 and here's why you lost those eight points, but this is what I saw in you in terms of your development as you worked on this assignment. Um, this is, and I wanted them to start thinking about that too, start thinking about their own development um, as opposed to what did I score and how do I get those points? Um, <clears throat> this came up in our early, first part of the conversation. Grades made me feel like um, I need to be or I could be objective, and I didn't think that was real anymore. Um, I, how, many of, how many of us, like you, when you're grading, and like I would do this all the time where I'd like, sometimes I'd like be grading papers, but I couldn't grade them all at once. So like you grade them in batches, and you get to the second batch, and you're like, oh. I need to go back and look at the first ones because I don't think I'm being fair anymore because I'm, I'm in a different place today. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking about this assignment differently. I'm in a bad mood or a better mood mm -hmm. um, than I was yesterday. And so now I need to go back and recalibrate and doing this constant like negotiation in my head that as um, Kathy said, is kind of this objectivity theater. It wasn't real. It was just a way for me to feel okay about it. So there was that piece of it, but there's also this piece of it. Um, this was another quote. I first became interested in this approach when I realized how traditional grading practices inadvertently punished the students at my alternative high school for things outside their control, poverty, mood disorders, unstable home lives. So part of this objectivity theater is also recognizing that our students all come to us from, with a different story, from a different place. And to expect that the way that we grade can, can objectify that at, and and basically erase those differences um, in, in a, with any kind of real authenticity is just, it's just not real, it, do, it can't happen. Um, I was talking with two of the students who are working here in, in the collab earlier this afternoon, they're sitting and I won't call them out by name and make it feel weird, but um, I was talking about this whole notion of what would it look like if instead of this being, we're all being compared to each other in an objective and fair way, what we really focus on is the development of every one single student from where they start to where they end up. And that was really where I wanted to get to, where I was treating my relationships with students individually and I was assessing them individually. 
The tattooed prof has just commented, objectivity theater. That is a perfect description. <laughs> Close up on <laughs> and her unit. We'll get her a t-shirt. He is a historian. I just want that on. Becky, there you go. Wave to the tattooed prof. He is there. Hello. Everybody saying hi. And then this last one, this is probably the hardest one, I think, for me to talk about and for a lot of us to talk about. And when I was looking around for people talking about it, it's actually the hardest one to, to see, to find, because I think it's the part of this that we feel worst about. Um, it, has, it has less to do with our students and a lot more to do with us. Um, and it's this notion that grading feels like how I make my work and my care for students visible or measurable that grading is part of teaching, that if I'm not grading, I'm not really teaching, that grading is like the dues we pay in order to be able to be teachers. Um, I'm not to, I don't know that everybody feels that, but I know I felt that at times, that I felt guilty when I stopped grading traditionally. I felt like I was getting away with something. Um, I was joking earlier about how at my previous institution, probably more me than anybody there, I always felt like I had to like secretly tell people, <laughs> you know, like, like we had to have a secret handshake and agree to meet in the back room and talk about it. Like it wasn't something we could just come out and say, well, I don't assign grades because there would just be this collective horror of like, but then how can you call yourself a teacher if you don't grade? Um, so I think this is something that we really have to, if that's something you're feeling, you really have to acknowledge and unpack and figure out how to give yourself space to explore alternative methods without feeling like you are somehow not living up to your responsibilities as a teacher. There's nothing more demoralizing than the thought that the countless hours we spend grading might be dismissed as meaningless. I think this is an anxiety lots of people have about their grading. So much effort, so much time, so much, frankly, like as much as we may be uncomfortable with grading, so much um, care, right? Like that process of grading papers and going back and recalibrating, that takes care. Like that's all coming from a place where we think we are doing the right thing for students. Um, when you think about all of that care, all of that time, all of that energy be, being wasted or not really representing what it is you think it represents, that's sort of depressing and demoralizing. And so getting to a place with our relationships with our students and our work with students where what we're doing really, that care feels visible but in really authentic, honest, real ways was part of my goal too. Um, oh, I have one more. Um, and this is, this is like, this is the, the, the kind of obvious one. Like, and there is so much research that backs this up, which is that grades are impeding actual learning. The first time I did ungrading um, was with a first year seminar at Mary Washington. And I felt a lot of guilt about it because um, similar to like the TWP here, it's the class that students take to kind of orient themselves to college. It's, there's a kind of open-ended content-y piece, but there's also a lot of, um, entry into the academic community and how to be a member and, and the mindsets that you need to succeed in college. Um, and I thought, well, is it really fair for me in this class that's supposed to be kind of the gateway to the university to grade them in a way that they will probably never experience again in the next four years? Like, shouldn't I be orienting them to this is what it's like to get graded in college? And I decided I didn't care and I did it anyway. Um, but the very first week, what I did is I gave the students um, Alfie Cohen's piece, which if you haven't read, you should, um, which is called The Case Against Grades. And I and this is a good time to say we'll be producing we be a resource of out of this event that will have everything that this event mentions and the video and whatever else. So, and out, so this piece, and I, I, so I introduced it to my students and they were kind of like side-eyeing me and like, what are we doing here? And I could tell they weren't really comfortable with it. They thought it was strange. What was I talking about? So I went, sent them home and I said, read this piece and come back and we're gonna talk about it. And it was like a complete mind shift. They were like, why is anybody grading us? This is so wrong, grading is terrible. It was like having, being able to look at that research and actually digest that, they suddenly realized, oh, there's, this is really problematic. Um, so if you're not familiar with the research that's out there, again, we'll be sharing stuff, but there is lots of really strong research that shows that grades actually inhibit and insert themselves into the relationships we're having with students in such problematic ways that it just, it erases any kind of intrinsic motivation that we're trying to develop in our students. So that was really the main, like, if you really, really wanna know why I wanted to do this, this was it. Grades seem so consequential that students believe 
they can't take a chance on anything unproven. In most college classes, a mistake is punished by a lower grade, which is then averaged into the other grades, even if the student completely gets it forever after that initial try. That's wrong, mm -hmm. right? They've learned it. Why is the grade not reflecting that? This is from Susan Bloom. She's at Notre Dame, and she's actually editing a book right now on ungrading. I don't think it's out yet. Um, but lots of, lots of interesting stuff um, that she's written about this as well. So what is ungrading? This is where we kind of, I want to, this is going to be pretty quick, um, talk about lots of different models. Um, the most important message I want to convey here is that there is not one way to do this. Um, there are so many different ways to do this. There are more ways to do this than I'm going to describe. You could come up with a new way of doing this that nobody's ever quite done before. Um, and that's a great challenge if that's something that you feel like you want to tackle. But there's also great models out there that you can use. And if you're just getting started with this, I so encourage you to just use a model that feels authentic, feels real to you. Um, the other piece of this is that you do not have to go all in, right? Ungrading does not mean that like starting, you're gonna go into class tomorrow and be like, we're throwing it all out from now on, everything's gonna be different. You can try this with a single assignment to get started, right? Um, and what you mostly need to do is what's comfortable, right? What works for you. Not, not even comfortable may not be the right word, but what you think works for you in terms of how you want to use assessment in your relationships with students. Um, so don't feel like anybody here is saying, if you don't do it this way, then you really don't belong in the ungrading club. Um, this is really, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a journey that you begin and you see where it takes you. So probably the most common, um, I think, technique for ungrading that a lot of us talk about, this is really what I do, is um, the model of self and peer evaluations. Um, this is a quote from my colleague, Jesse Stommel, um, at the University of Mary Washington, where I just came from. Um, so currently, I have students write self-reflections two to three times throughout the term. The first of these is usually more directed with specific questions, the last of which opens into something more like an essay. My goal is to help students develop their ability to do this kind of metacognitive work. Self-evaluation and metacognition are not easy, even for me, so I give students space to figure out how to do this work as they go. And this is the model that I have used. I have students, um, I have students do self-evaluations um, at standard points, like set points during the semester. I've also taught where I tell students, look, these are, um, this is when you can do a, like this is when I'm gonna ask you to do a self-evaluation, but you actually can do one any week of the semester. Um, if you feel like you need to check in with me about your grade and or how you're doing in the class, do a self-evaluation that week. I will always have that conversation with you. Interestingly, when I offer that to students, they're like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't need to do that. Um, so. The, the self-evaluation, as Jesse says, and this can be really formal, can be really structured. Um, I tend to do that where I give students sometimes a really structured, particularly in a first year seminar, where I'm really trying to get them thinking about this stuff differently, and they are like, deer in the headlights, what do you want me to write? So I give them a lot of prompts, a lot of ideas, questions to answer, think about, um, to everything where, as Jesse says, write me a letter and tell me about your process. I'll talk Can about that Can we just pause second. for a minute and everybody yeah. wave to Joey <coughs> Reno, who's joining us online. There's a bunch of people online, but Joey Reno, we especially want to say hello to you because <laughs> you're one of our people. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. One of the resources you might be able to help us yes. with the questions. For Absolutely. Questions. So yeah. we're going to build some time into this session today at the very end for you guys to tell us what you need um, so that we can build a resource mm -hmm. that we'll make available both to you, but also publicly on our website mm -hmm. that has models, answers questions, points to new resources. Um, so please, like, take notes as you're as you're listening about um, about what you might like. Anybody here do self evaluations now? Anybody? Oh, lots of you. So, um, anybody want to talk a little bit about like how that what that's like getting started with, or how that's working? <laughs> yes. Is it a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I usually, in, in a couple of my classes, I ask them between the first and second class to write about a page. Mm -hmm. What do you think you'll probably learn in this class? What do you hope to learn? And what are the sources of information for what you already know? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And then at the end of the semester, they go back to that paper and they add, um, and I ask them, you know, did you learn what you thought you were going to learn? What did you learn that you didn't expect? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I also 
say, you know, go ahead and give some constructive criticism, but remember that your name's on this one, and right. you've got an opportunity to evaluate the course and honestly, yes. if you want to say something yes. pretty sharp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to give them that option as well. I love that question of what resources do you have now, and then having them revisit that at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting how just asking those kinds of questions at the onset can help it works for us too, it works for them, can help focus and shift their attention in interesting ways in the class. Um, like meta, That's what metacognition does. It doesn't have to be fancy and overwrought. It's really just about ex bringing forward and exposing mm. what's happening so that it's at the forefront as opposed to tacit, unspoken stuff that's happening that everybody's like, I think maybe we're developing, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure how. Um, any other examples anybody wanna talk, talk about? Yeah, Caleb. So I took my six month eval as a professional staff member and I uh, tweaked the language for my students to answer That's the awesome. questions. <laughs> and I facilita facilitated one to one um, meetings with them yeah. where they evaluate me and I evaluate them. Yeah. Oh, I love that they evaluate you too. That's great. Um, that can be like incredibly scary for some people. It is uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> it can be really uncomfortable, but I will say that like, when I, I always ask questions like that, I get really interesting stuff out of my students when I ask them to tell me what's working or not working in the class. Um, and sometimes it's stuff that I'm like, sorry, you can't change that. Um, but sometimes it's like, oh wow, yeah, I need to do a better job on that. I've kind of dropped the ball. Mm -hmm. Um, so self and peer evaluations are a really easy way to get started. You can incorporate this into more traditional assessment too, um, but building some kind of reflection, metacognition, related to this that Jesse also talks about a lot are process letters, which is sort of the completely open-ended um, self-evaluation, where you really are just asking them to write you a letter, um, usually at the end, um, usually tends to be more summative right at the end where they just reflect upon their journey through the class. Um, what I like about this too in this quote that he talks about, you might also ask students to take pictures of their work, add voice over to a screencast, or he said students shoot video. So opening this up to, this doesn't, this is, doesn't just have to be a, a Word document or a Google Doc that they send to you, but if there are other ways that are comfortable for them, of, of sharing that process and that journey with you. That can be a really, really rich experience and sometimes just giving them that option also makes, like, turns on a light bulb for them and they're like, oh, well if I can document it that way, <laughs> then suddenly I can show things and share things that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And see things themselves that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So grade-free zones are an interesting take on this and the idea here is that, or grade-free assignments, is that you're not gonna make your entire class ungraded, you're going to create very clearly defined grade-free areas of your class. Um, so maybe certain assignments are grade-free or certain tests are grade-free or a few weeks of the semester are grade-free um, where you exper experiment with this and explore this and use that as an opportunity to talk to students more explicitly about grades and about how grades work and function and maybe talk like afterwards about like well what did it feel like to have an assignment or a section of the class go grade free um, as a way to have kind of a conversation about their learning. Anybody here do grade free stuff like in, in the context of larger? So what do you use it doing grade free? What I'm putting you on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, depending on the class, but every single class in this semester, I'm able to implement some of the grade free. Mm -hmm. And um, I think most of the, it's the grading, it would be feedback. Right, and it should inform their future their process. process. Yeah. And I think it's a combination of what a lot of us are already doing from conferences as right. a way to debrief in that. Right. And then there's also a um, section where they reflect on themselves. Right. And then there's a section on how might I be able to do that better the next right. time. And I too have had plenty of moments of, um, <laughs> I can definitely do that better. Yes, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're able to make that part of this process, I think that's really, really useful. Did you say you also do great? Yeah, what? so I'm trying with the blogging. They're yeah. blogging on news, uh, current events, conflicts. And, and I, I, I should say it's a grade free zone because I'm not yet ungrading because I haven't been able to provide individual feedback. Right. We've kind of reviewed in class, you know, yep. what are good and what are not yep. good. And, and I don't think I did that. I talked to you about this the other day. I didn't do that very well. Um, cause I felt a little bit like, 
you know, I said, these are ungraded, you know, here's the standards, do what you want. And then I was like, oh no, this is wrong, this is wrong. <laughs> and I kind of felt like it was very demoralizing for them. I'm like, but we'll talk more about that. And I mean, I want to get to that point where I'm providing much yes. more individual. But at this point, I felt like, I just want you to feel like this is a zone you can just try, right? right. And there's no punishment. Yeah. At the same time, I do have like this standard. I'm hoping they're going to do the assignment right. right, and they're not just putting up anything, <laughs> right? which is kind of where we are. It's, but I invited yeah. that, so now yeah. I've got to figure out how do I reel that back right. in? How do you reel that back in? Yeah, which is what you were saying reminded me of what you are talking about in terms of this grade that sort of sticks, uh -huh. right? Like, there gets to be wrong. Like, wrong is <laughs> right. a thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, but it doesn't have to be a thing that yes. stays forever for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. 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 You can right. handle, like, yeah. But in wrong. fact, yeah. it's a really bad lesson to tell students that once you're wrong, you're wrong. Forever. Right. There's no, there's like, no right then why are we here? Yeah. Uh, we can't right. actually improve. Right. Right. So Another good collab t-shirt. <laughs> We're getting to that one too. Right. Um, yeah, I was going to say one of the things that that quickly becomes apparent to me as I'm looking at this is that you can't. It's tricky because you can't. Um, you can't be like, I'm going to do radically different things with assessment, but really traditional assignments, right? <laughs> Nor can you be like, I'm going to do really radical assignments, but really traditional assessment. Right. So the two things really go hand in hand. And sometimes that's what's uncomfortable for people is they're like, well, I'm fine with ungrading, but I really like my assignments. Mm. And it may actually mean you have to go back and look at the kinds of assignments you have in your class, the kind of work you're having students do and think, how do I shift this so that it goes hand in hand with a, a radical assessment technique? Um, and that, that's an iterative process. Like you probably won't get it 100% right the first time because you're figuring it out as well. Um, the other piece of this that's kind of like been a lesson for me is, and this is also, this goes to like the guilt of like, I'm not grading, I'm not teaching. Um, I teach this class occasionally, this digital storytelling class that's really, really a lot of work for students. Um, it's a lot of fun work, but it's a lot. They just, it's, they're meant to generate a ton ton of stuff as part of the process of working through the class um, and as a result like there is more stuff than I could possibly look at mm. Um, mm. like 30 students in the class and they might be doing seven to ten assignments a week mm -hmm. like, like well, of course I'm ungrading because like nobody <laughs> could grade that that's impossible mm. <clears throat> so I actually had to get to a point where um, I don't look at it all right like I don't look at everything they do and I don't feel guilty about that. Um, there are certain things I definitely look at, and I'm constantly scanning and dipping in and leaving comments mm -hmm. at every time I can, at all times that I can. But I let go of this sense that my job as an instructor is to witness and assess everything my students do mm -hmm. as part of this course experience. Mm -hmm. Because that's their story, right? Like that's a journey that they are on, and I am here to guide that and help them through it and step in if they get lost and have their back. But really, my job isn't to, to evaluate every single thing they do um, as part of that journey. Um, and for me, that was a really big mind shift. Mm -hmm. I still feel guilt about it at times, where I'm like, oh, I really should be reading everything they do. But, you know, I'm only one person. So, so that's grade free zones. Yeah. Just do your, can you talk about the awareness that your students have? That I'm not looking at everything. Looking at their work. Yeah. Yeah, so there's so there's a couple of things, there's a couple of nuances that, to that class that are important, which is that every week, in addition to doing this kind of like generating lots of work, every week they do have to submit to me, um, well submit to me, they have to write up and I look at a kind of summary, um, a, like a process summary of the week. And those I do, like as long as they turn them in on time and I, like I'm looking, if it's a week late I might miss it. Um, I do look at and I like leave feedback for and talk to them about, um, but I don't necessarily go and look at every little thing that they've referenced, and they know that, um, but they will also call stuff out to me, right? Like this is a completely online class, I should mention as well. Mm -hmm. I've taught it face-to-face, -face, but now I only teach it online. Um, so, but they will, they will kind of like on Twitter, or we would use Slack for this class, they'll be like, have you looked at this thing I did? So it actually gets to a point where it's much more what I want, which mm -hmm. is like, mm -hmm. They get, they, not everything they produce is like, Martha, look at this, Martha, look at this, Martha, look at this. But there are certain things they produce, they know they've done something great, and they're really proud of it. And those are the things they call my attention to, if I haven't commented on it. So in my mind, when that happens, I'm like, oh, this is, this looks to me like the kind of conversation I want to be having with my students. 
where they recognize that they don't need me to look at everything, but they always know if there's something really important, something they're really proud of, that they can bring it to my attention. So yeah, um, so, so now we're getting into some more specific sort of um, approaches to thinking about assignments and how you construct assignments when you're doing ungrading. So this is contract grading. Has, does anybody here do contract grading? So I'm gonna ask you to talk about that a second, Matt. Um, I'll try and give my view of it and then you can talk about how you do it. So contract grading, there are a couple of different variations upon this. Sometimes, um, most commonly I would say, um, contract grading is sort of a contract that the whole class shares, where you say, um, this is what you need to do in this class to get a C, this is what you need to do in this class to get a B, this is what you need to do in this class to get an A. Um, sometimes faculty will negotiate that even further on an individual basis with students. Um, one of the variations upon this that I've seen as well is starting the class out by um, asking students, what grade are you hoping to get in this class? Because very often students are taking our classes saying, I need to get this grade in order to get my GPA to this place, right? <coughs> if you're not having that conversation with students in some form or another, I highly recommend it. It is so enlightening because most of us who work in higher education are people who like to get good grades. <laughs> um, that's why we then decided to become teachers um, and work with students. So I would always go into classes with this assumption that all my students were like me, right? They want an A because I always wanted A's. Um, it's not true. Um, and that's okay, right? And so I got to a point when I do self-evaluations, I see this, but also if you just have an explicit private conversation <laughs> with students about like, well, what, like, what are your goals for this class? Like both in terms of what you wanna learn, but also in terms of what grade you're hoping to get. Um, that suddenly just shifted my mind, my mindset. I was like, oh, if they're not looking to get an A, then I don't need to feel guilty that they're not getting an A, right? Um, and so, so doing that side by side with contract grading I think is interesting where you're both talking very explicitly about this is what the grade represents, this is how you can earn it, but also who are you as a person and what are you hoping to get out of this class? Um, you know, I've worked with students, particularly non-traditional students, older students, so much going on in their lives, they have to make critical choices and decisions about where they put their energy. I'll call them in to talk to me, I'll be like, oh, I noticed you're falling behind on this, you haven't done this, and they're like, look, you know, I got kids, I got a job, I got a family, I had to make a choice, I love this class, but I know it's gonna affect my grade, and I'm like, okay then, we are on the same page, I respect that choice you've made, let's just move forward. Um, so some of this is just, uh, contract grading gives you that opportunity to just have a really explicit conversation with students about what the grade represents in the class, what they're hoping for, and how you are going to evaluate it. Sometimes that contract is negotiated in class with student input, right? So it isn't you coming in and saying, this is what I say, but you have a whole conversation in the class about this is what we're gonna do, let's talk about what this should be worth. <coughs> Matt, you wanna talk about how you do this and Sure. Um, I, I don't do it in IDS oh, so sorry. much as I did it um, when I taught composition at UNH, um, and some uh, colleagues and I, as grad students there, developed uh, a system of contract grading for comp classes because we weren't really satisfied with the heavily um, lots of objectivity theater sort of syllabi that we had been given, which is like down to really specific numbers on every single little thing, and had you doing more work and more reading than any one of us could really keep up with. Um, so we turned to a system that Peter Elbow created. He's a, a compositionist, and I'm sure we can link to him from our, our um, resources page. And he came up with um, a, a contract for getting a B in the class. And it's all really doable stuff. It's, it's not sort of like judging quality of things. It's, uh, I pulled it up here. So it's like um, complete all assignments and activities on time according to the guidelines and work <laughs> demonstrates effort and care. You uh, substantially revise your drafts at particular stages, those sorts of things. Do all of these things, and I guarantee you, you will get a B in this class. And then anything beyond a B, we're going to negotiate together if you want to. Um, and that worked out actually really well. It met the needs of the institution. It didn't get us in trouble as uh, <laughs> grad students. It allowed us to create the kinds of grades that the institution wanted us to create. 
Um, and it worked really well in students be with students because it was really, really clear. Because they could ask, how am I doing? I could say, let's look at the, the B contract. Are you on, on task to get a B? And usually they more or less were, um, or it would give them something to, to aim for. Um, and then the students who really were like, I need to get an A for whatever reason, then that became an interesting conversation. Um, and it worked out pretty well. It did involve um, a lot of prep beforehand, though, as we'll keep saying in yeah. this workshop, that it, even that, which I, don't, I think of as fairly <laughs> traditional, um, even that took a lot of conversation early on to get students able to wrap their heads around it. Yeah, and so like a, a lot of times, I, I'll come just a second, I'm just gonna say that a lot of times like the energy that you might have been putting into like grading, you will now be putting into mm -hmm. thinking about how you are going to grade, right? Coming up with an approach to this. Yeah. So that sounds, oh, at my previous institution, we did a lot with specifications grading yep. from, I think it was Lemon was the one that did, she had a bunch yes. of about it. Yep. Um, and I think just on a pure mechanical level, one of the things, like challenge, greatest challenges I had with that was I loved it in theory because we could say, in this class you can do this many portions of this big project to get a C, and you can do this many, you know, parts of it to get a B and you can kind of like level it out that way. But there's no, I don't know of any way in our learning management systems to present that to mm -hmm. our students in a clear mm -hmm. grading mm -hmm. way. And nice. that to me has been a really big challenge and that yeah. might be a, my inefficiency at Moodle no. <laughs> issue. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I don't no. think that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, yeah. so I, I do something in my creating games class that is, it's contract grading, but I use a game metaphor. And one of the things that's really challenging is every week it's really time consuming on my part because I, so, so the way it works is the class has a bunch of assignments, way more than any one student is gonna do. At the beginning of the semester, the students identify the grade that they want. I've got a, a set of levels, because it's a game class. Mm -hmm. So you level up at certain points and the students write what we call a strategy paper, where they pick and choose the things they're gonna do over the course of the summer semester in order to get to the grade that they want. But the, the challenge with that is that at any given point, they don't understand, and I don't really understand, the relationship between the number of points they currently have in the class and a letter grade. And so every week, mm -hmm. I have to create manually mm -hmm. this leaderboard where I count the number of students who are at each level and report that along with the average number of grades so that they have something to compare themselves mm -hmm. to. Oh my to God. Understand. <laughs> Can I just jump in and say that in like a week or two, we are having a event in here led by Emma from math and it's a grade speculation calculator that she's invented. And I think um, she wants to show us all how to use it. It's for students to use on themselves. But maybe we could trick it out to be helpful to this process. And she's pretty mathy, so I bet she can help us out. <laughs> um, but that's so funny, because I think that's what her um, thing is designed to do with them. It'll be more complicated in your system, but I bet it could be done. And Moodle gets in my way yeah. all over the place yeah. with this because when you said that, there were all these little hearts on Periscope, and you were like, "And Moodle is really hard." To <laughs> and, and everyone watching was like, "Yes, yes, yes." <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Moodle forces a percentage, so like, there's say there's yeah. two thousand points in the class, and the student has done three hundred. Mm. It says they have enough. Like, it, yeah. it makes no sense. Yeah. So, and like, yeah. not and few things make me more crazy. People who know me this know this than when technology <laughs> dictates how we're teaching um, so I would say that like that is a challenge that we need to rise to like if that's a grading approach an assessment approach that's working for you the last thing that should be prohibiting you or inhibiting you from doing that is the learning management system <laughs> and I won't use the word I want to use to describe that but I think you can probably guess um, so yeah I would say let's try and tackle that and figure out what tools can we put together or resources to help people do that yeah so as we're doing that, can we have um, a consideration for how the students interface and interact with that? Yes. Because as you're describing this, I'm like, man, there's so many apps that do that, where we catalog and quantify all of our stuff, and that's how they know mm -hmm. how to interact with that sort of information. Yeah. It's like, seems so achievable. Yeah. And then much more 
accessible and useful to them mm -hmm. than the current things we yes. have, whether it's an Excel sheet that we can call to ourselves or yes. some. Absolutely. I think that's a really, really good point. And it's the part of this too that can't get lost, which is that, and this is like an interesting point. I'm glad you say that because I don't have a slide about this specifically, but when we're talking about all of these ungrading techniques and we're thinking about, well, that'll work for me, that'll work for me. It is so important that we are also always saying, does that work for the student? Like, is that really going to work for my students? Um, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds of this stuff and lose sight of what our real objective here needs to be. Um, and the last thing we wanna do is create a new system that hurts our students in different ways. Um, so yes. So the contract grading, this is a quote from Kathy Davidson, contract grading is both an idealistic student-centered way of writing one's own learning goals, and it is quite overtly a workaround. Those are my favorite things, where it helps us and it helps them. It does what we need it to do, but it also is a workaround for us, a better alternative to conventional grading and credentialing. Um, some people, I'm gonna, I wanna be mindful of time, and some people have already talked about some of these other um, approaches, spec grading. So the spec grading and bundled assignments is kind of like a derivative of contract grading, um, where you're really, uh, like, for assignments, you literally are telling students, in order to pass this assignment, you must do these things. And if you don't do them, you don't get points for that assignment. But you can revise, you can resubmit. Um, in order to get those points. And then you bundle assignments so that you have to do so much, you have to do these sets of spec assignments in order to get this grade, you have to do these set of spec assignments to do that grade. As Matt was talking about, you get into the, this kind of approach, there's a lot of work in thinking about that structure. Um, so again, it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm gonna regain all of this time because I'm no longer grading, it just may mean that you're putting some of that time and effort into thinking before at the beginning thinking more about how do I structure this in such a way that it makes sense and probably the first time you're doing it be prepared to maybe have to shift because once it's the rubber hits the road it doesn't maybe work the same way um, this is a great quote um, it took some time for them to grapple with the new system but I think they got it uh, I sense that they mostly thought it was a cool idea one said it's kind of like a board game Mm -hmm. uh, which is what Kathy was talking about, which I affirmed, but emphasized that winning means understanding the system enough to actively engage in the material, um, not to game the system, right? And that's like that's the other part of this that I'm talking about. Like it's really easy. Like we're like this is so cool, and what you now have turned class into is you know a board game where nobody's actually learning; they're just trying to figure out how to get the points, right? Which really wasn't what we were after. Surly Acres online has some very interesting comments that are feeding <laughs> through my feed. I, really know, so. like, I know I can talk here with my face. But I <laughs> <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm trying to engage the world. You'll have to watch on the replay if you that's want right. to know the, the sub tweeting that's happening. Um, minimal grading. This is Peter Elbow is really the one who, um, if you don't know Peter Elbow, you Matt just talked about Peter Elbow. Um, his website has amazing resources. We will also be sharing that with you. Um, um, and minimal grading is another aspect of contract grading where you just, you kind of do away with this whole notion of like A, B, C, D, E, F, and you're like, there's pass and there's not pass. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, it's a, spec grading is kind of a variation of this as well. Um, even though minimal grading removes the incentive to strive for an A for excellence, we get to ask students to write far more than if we had to grade everything carefully. We get to ask them to think actively about far more of the course material. Um, so you're kind of just pulling away some of the extraneous um, noise um, around a complex grading system and signaling to them um, through a, a rather minimal set of possibilities of how they can do on an assignment. You either got it, you're kind of there, or you didn't get it. Um, so just a much clearer communication and language with students about um, about how they're doing. This is a really cool thing, ungraded exams. I've always wanted to explore ungraded exams. This, um, Clarissa, who, do, were you were talking about Rissa, right? Yep. Rissa Sorensen Unru, who, um, who's gonna be part of that webinar in January? February. February, has this great article, again, we'll share the link, about her doing this. And the way that she does this is, she gives exams, she's a chemist, she teaches at a community college. Um, she gives exams and she tells students, she goes through and she grades them, right? She gives feedback on the questions, not so much marks them, but you know, um, responds to all of the questions, but she doesn't show her students that. She lets, um, she let, then they have a conversation in class where they go through the exam together, and she has the students evaluate how they did based on that conversation, 
and then they come together and they look at what the student, the grade the student gave themselves, and the grade that she gave them, and they have a conversation about if there's a disconnect, um, what's going on there, and she gives them opportunities to revise and revisit and and improve. Um, and I love this quote from her article: "God, I love my students, even when I didn't really care about the outcome. They made a really good." great choice that maximized their learning process every time. So just by bringing them into this process, giving them some agency into um, looking at their work and understanding how they did, they were able to start making really good choices um, to maximize their actual learning, right? Not just to get a better grade, but to improve how they were doing. So that's ungraded exams. There's lots of different ways to kind of do under, ungraded exams. Um, but I love the idea of taking exams, which we're all like, well, if we're doing ungrading, we're not doing exams, right? Well, maybe we are doing exams. We're just not going to assess them the way that we've always assessed exams. <clears throat> Formative assessment, this isn't so much a tech, uh, like an ungrading technique as it is just a component of so much of what we're talking about here. Um, Matt had a great, you want to share your formative summative? Sure. Yeah, great so Matt Project Runway fans formative. out there. Uh, <laughs> so how to think about the difference between formative and summative assessment. On Project Runway, Tim Gunn is all formative assessment. He's helping the contestants figure out what to do. He's a mentor. Occasionally, he's a critic for the person who's sort of gotten a little wayward. Um, and then when they go to judging, which Tim Gunn does not participate in, judging is summative assessment. That's where the hammer comes down. You're out. <laughs> yes. So the idea of formative assessment is that this is the assessment that we give to students as they are doing the work. It is not the grade we give them at the end. It is the feedback we give them to help them improve the work as they're doing it. This is a quote from my friend and colleague, Steve Greenlaw at the University of Mary Washington. I owe a lot to him for why I started ungrading in the first place. And it was a presentation he did to our first year seminar faculty that really got me thinking how I wanted to do this differently. And what he was talking about was grading student papers in first year seminar. And a really simple approach he took, which was that he would give students a deadline for the paper um, and he would give them feedback. He'd give them formative feedback on that paper. Um, <coughs> not everything, right? Like, not like I am going to mark this paper up with everything I can think of, but he would focus on like one aspect maybe. And he'd give it back to them, but with no grade. Um, and then they could revise. And they could revise between that and the end of the semester as many times as that they wanted. And at every draft, he would do that kind of formative feedback, um, but never ever talk about grades. And the idea being that you just pull grades completely out of the equation. And if you get students into that practice where they're doing revision and you are really giving them feedback to help guide them through that revision, the grade becomes irrelevant because you know that they are going to over time improve through that process. Um, and Steve is economics, right? Yes, That's his Steve teaches field. economics. Rissa's chemistry. I mean, I think yeah. it's important when a lot of people sometimes think all of this comes from the humanities. So, well, so we're really trying to keep a balance across disciplines when we talk about this. And it is definitely true that a lot of like the early working, ungrading, a lot of alternative assessment comes out of composition. Um, I think just because those people have like so much grading to do. <laughs> that they're like, we have to find a better way. So a lot of these people do come from composition, but yeah, Robin's absolutely right. Like we can find examples of this in just all kinds of different disciplines, really great, interesting models. Um, and then this last one is competency-based assessment. This is where I'm gonna kind of turn things over to Sue because this is her, um, her um, area of expertise in particular. She has many. But for what we're going to be doing today, she has a lot of expertise in competency-based assessment and the way that they're doing that in education. Um, and I have a quote up here, but I don't need to read it um, unless it's something that you want to refer to if there's anything useful there. Um, and this is, yeah. What? So I, I have a question I think is going to yes. bridge yeah. what we just said about formative and what I think this is. I feel like sometimes it's unfair in formative assessment just to give feedback and say, keep doing a little better because I'm not giving them a goal. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, it's almost like rubrics are the opposite of formative. Right. That's just free formative. Keep yep. keep trying, and I'm stuck because. And I talked about this in a an open reflective practice just yesterday with another colleague who was kind of struggling with this. Like I actually have in my mind right. what that should look like. Right. 
but I don't want to tell them because I'm open. Right. But I feel like it's so unfair. Right. Like so to not to you know, not just tell them what you're looking yeah, for. So mm. Yeah. So I, I I do formative and I love formative and I'm doing formative. I think now. Yeah. But there's an almost unfairness. Like keep guessing how close you are to what I right. really want. <laughs> I see Sue. Is that a bridge? Like, Running her hands together. I'm going to let her Like the her. perfect bridge. Yeah. Go. Okay, so, so Sue's going to take it away from here and take us through an exercise. I do, we are going to try and end with a few minutes left so you guys can tell us what you need in order to. This seems rude to the people online, but does anybody want a cookie <laughs> also? Because <laughs> I actually was like shooting that. As I was. But anyway, I'm just going to hold them out in case people don't want to get up there. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to be real quick because I want this to be about you in about five minutes. Um, when I say the word competency or competent, what does that make you think of? All the things I'm not competent in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what else does it make you think Ability. of? Ability. Ability. Mastery, maybe. Yeah. Mastery. Anything else? You're picturing someone who's competent. You're confident. Good enough. Red Good enough. Cross. Good enough. <laughs> Red Cross. <laughs> Anything else? I feel like you have an answer that I should be no. guessing. <laughs> I'm using weak pie. Okay. I feel like competent often, we use that word as though it's not a positive. Like, you're competent, but you're not excellent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can get by. Right. So when we, when you hear, when you often hear the term competency-based education, it is often connected to mastery learning. Mm -hmm. How do you demonstrate us that you have control over a skill or a strategy? Are you able to demonstrate understanding, <laughs> or are you able to do something? But the way I'm, I really hope you think about competency education in the framework of ungrading is. Learning is a continuum. It never ends. And the only way to learn effectively and the only way to teach effectively is to provide feedback that really helps the learner understand where they are, know where they need to go, and what they need to do to get there. So, um, so I'd like to play around with that for a little bit. Whitney, most people feel the way you feel about giving formative um, feedback because fee formative feedback is often confused with praise. Mm -hmm. So this is where folks struggle um, and often have this war between themselves. How can I provide feedback that is really going to move a learner forward? So I could say, good job, Susie. That was an awesome paper. Wow, that was great. Or, ooh, Susie, keep trying. You can keep trying. But without a specific criteria for what does that look like, what do I need to do, where can I go, am I even close, that, that turns into praise as opposed to feedback. So my goal for the next few minutes is just to share a simple example of a way that we address this um, with our student teachers. I have them for their last three semesters. So when I think about, oops, I'll do this. When I think about um, our student teachers at the end, the target is, Mm -hmm. that they will be highly effective teachers in the classroom. It's a high-stakes summative assessment. They will be judged, just like on Project One Runway. Are mm -hmm. they having a positive impact on young learners? I cannot send out teacher candidates who received a C or a B on a lesson plan because that's not a highly effective lesson plan. Um, so I struggled with assigning grades to things that have to be highly effective. I can't just say, oh, you passed. So that's when I ended up going to the Academic Technology Institute last May, and I heard Jesse. And it changed, I know. <laughs> 
in my summer, summer like went gonna be. poof <laughs> um, because I had to redo everything. And I know because of what I heard and the time that I put in, I'm a more effective teacher, which will make our candidates more effective. So I would love to share an example of a single point rubric. And this is just one example of ungrading. Um, you can pass it. Thank you. I have this one. Oh, oh, yeah, one you, yeah. Yeah. Jillian has this. <laughs> Jillian has this. Um, yeah. Yep. And I should probably have kept one. Oh, thank you. You have it memorized. So this is this is technically a rubric, even though there's no. Yeah. Yeah. So as as you look at this, what I want you to picture is a traditional four or five point rubric. And you know that score of three? It's like that's what I'm really looking for. They could have a score of four and exceed, or a score of two approaching. This is that three. Okay. This is the this is non-negotiable. In order for your lesson plan to be approved to teach with real children, <laughs> you're gonna have an impact on them. I can't again. I can't send someone out there to work with real children who received a C and just stop. It's constant improvement, feedback. But I go back to the three questions that we have. Um, I'm going to say hi to Dr. Reno um, because it was an exciting week for us. We, we want our student teachers to integrate, but in our, in our program, we taught in silos, the language arts, person, science, math. So Dr. Reno and I integrated for our students in team taught. And it was the most exciting class I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> and the students said it flew by because it made so much sense to them because we were working as a team. The next class that we had, this, it was an open lab. And students were asked to design a lesson plan with this rubric as a guide that they're familiar with. As they're working independently, I'm able to use it as formative assessment, but I'm also able to confer with them while they're working. So they can self-assess as they're going, which Jesse talked about. Eventually, they can peer assess because another teacher should be able to pick up your plan for your learning experience and run with it. Another way that we can do it I can go up to them with these three questions. So, what are you doing? How are you doing? And what are you doing to get there? Instead of giving them specific feedback, by having them explain what they're doing in relation to the rubric, they're assessing themselves. And they're pulling out evidence from what they're doing to show me I've really got this. This is something that I can go and do and work with children on this. So again, I used to use those four or five point rubrics. I would assign a grade. But what happened is as soon as they saw that grade, they were done thinking about that lesson or thinking about how can I make it even more effective? How can I make it a more effective learning experience for real children? So this this is what really changed for me. Um, but any questions about, about the rubric before I go on? Can I say with working with students who are mostly working online or in the open, I also realized how different a B was now when, um, so like I have no problem putting like B, C, even D work on the internet, but what you don't wanna put on the internet is generally, anything other than the best thing you could do, right? Sometimes the best thing I can do is not great and that's fine, but the best thing you can do, and with students it always felt odd if you're working in public, like you need to, you need to keep improving that literally till it's the best you have before you wanna share it because you're asking for collaboration, you're asking for people to take their time and invest it in you. Um, so that was part of the motivation of IDS going to this um, kind of shareability factor like is this ready 
to, and I like that when you think about teachers too, like when you're thinking about how good does something have to be, I think it's funny that we don't ask the question for what, mm -hmm. you know? And that also gets back to like Liz sometimes, I, and maybe you don't even sort of note this, but uh, pushing back on like, does everything need to be public? Like, because some things, the for what is for myself, for the trash can, for a try, for a, you know, but sometimes the for what, a B plus does not make sense, you know? So I like that idea of sort of thinking about what do you need this for? And in that case, you really can't afford to stop be informative with your thing as early as we might normally. And that's probably why you end up getting such better quality when things are ungraded oftentimes because that middle zone gets to keep on trying. Mm -hmm. And the mm. other thing, when I, when I think about um, something Martha had shared prior to this, she, she shared a slide about minimal. And when I think about the work that was done this summer to shift to include more ungrading, I really did have to get rid of assignments that really didn't have an impact on them as being highly effective teacher candidates. So there were things it's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it wouldn't really have an impact. But what grew out of that were more opportunities for this. Um, they start designing learning experiences in a collaborative format, very much in a group way then it's partners, and then it's individual, and then they're out there student teaching. So it's, it's building up to independence, but until it's time for that summative independence, my job is to provide formative feedback that really can improve their teaching and their design of learning experiences up until that point. So I see it kind of at, they've got that high stakes assessment hanging out there and they don't, letter grades are really not going to be enough to help move them forward. So this, this was just one example. So I have a question about your single point rubric. The second item, lesson plan actively engages learners. Yeah. Do you have students who say, well, uh, the lesson provides opportunities for student choice, collaboration and or self-assessment, how many opportunities is enough? Like what, what, what are yep. those conversations all about? And, and how do they know when they've come to the end of that conversation? Yep. They've, it's not about quantity, but about um, engagement for their learners. So they would describe their lesson to me. And that's just one thing that they would touch upon. My, and learner, my learners are engaged because, mm -hmm. and they're telling me how. So it could be through, um, for example, when we team taught and did our math lesson, um, they had the choice to work there or to get up and physically move and confer with another learner about their math model. They had a choice over the math materials that they could pull in and work with to build their math model. So if a teacher candidate said that to me, I'd be like, you're giving your learners choice, therefore they will be more engaged. Mm -hmm. So not so much a quantity of... But I mean, are there times when you think, yeah, that's not really enough. Mm -hmm. how, and how do yes. you, how do you, do you kind of Socratically try to get them to realize that? Or, how, you know, do you finally say, you know what, actually that's not enough. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, that's not a very engaging engagement. <laughs> yeah. And there are times where, because most of the time, the feedback between myself and a student is one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, if it is in a group, mm -hmm. I'll throw it back to the group and say, here's, here's this student's idea, does anyone else have something they would like to add to that? Mm -hmm. What were you thinking about that? I, I kind of go back to those three questions again um, from John Hattie of how did you do this and why did you do this? Mm -hmm. So throwing it back on them, if I'm asking a how question or a why question, other people are gonna join in. Well, let me tell you what I'm thinking about that. Um, but there are times when I say, okay, teach me and see if I'm actively engaged in the learning and how. So there are times you do push back and say it isn't enough. Mm -hmm. But it's not so much about amount, but the quality of the engagement. I think what I like about this is the demonstration piece because, you know, to say to students, did you connect 
this knowledge to previous knowledge. You say, oh, I mentioned that in the lesson. Didn't you hear me say that? Is that demonstration? That, yes. you know, like you, you could challenge the student. Like, yes. you didn't really in incorporate previous learning content with this mm -hmm. content. You just mentioned it in passing because you knew that was important. So how might you demonstrate connection between the old and the new better? Right, and normally that would have to be written out in right. the plan. So and it makes them aware of, of there's different levels of demonstration. Yes. There's I mentioned it, which isn't very demonstrative, <laughs> and there's I had students practice it and do it, right? right. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Any other questions about that? The rubric itself. So the way I the way I thought about it is when student teachers are getting ready to go out and student teach, a critical skill for them is designing a learning experience. So what I would really like you guys to think about and to talk about is what are those critical skills in your course, in your program, that your students have to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now, not, not next week, but what do they have to hang on to? We, in the edu world, it's called an essential understanding. Mm -hmm. They have to have this to be successful in your discipline. So, so we're gonna let you guys talk. <laughs> um, I actually have about 18 minutes left. <laughs> about. I think probably what would be a good idea is to kind of yep. take five process, think, write a bit, um, but then we want to probably go to the next thing because we really do see this as phase one, phase two, we're going to kind of build and re-deliver to you so that you can use it individually to, um, and we want to customize that by talking to you about what we can provide. So let's just take five minutes to think about this slide and uh, what takeaways you might want to note down for yourself. Yeah, and, and if you also want to make notes of anything that would be helpful for you going forward so that when we come back to talk you can share that with us and we can make sure we're um, taking our own notes and can turn this into something useful for everybody. I feel very awkward standing here. I'm just like that. Hi everybody, it's Robin, your filmmaker from the Ontario University System of New Hampshire, and this team is going to be putting that together in February, so you can watch um, my Twitter account at Actual Ham or at PSU Open Collab um, is the official Twitter account of the Collab, and um, we'll be putting some information out there as well. Um, and I also wanted to remind folks that we are going to be releasing an online resource from this ungrading event. Um, so you can find that at www.plymouth.edu slash something. Hold on. What's the collab old? No. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. I'm the only one on it. Um, the uh, web address in the old one, Plymouth.edu slash... I don't think so. PSU Open. Yeah. www.plymouth.edu slash PSU Open. And then Martha will redirect you to the really special web address. Anyway, so you call it... I 
to really synthesize a little bit. Um, I also want to tell you that someone who shall not be named stepped out to use the restroom and <laughs> live streamed from the restroom so they would not miss any of this event. <laughs> um, so these are new uses for the technology that I had not anticipated. This is why we use Periscope. This is why we have technology. Yeah, we'll call her Potty Scope. Um, potty Scope. Oh my God. Okay. Um, so with that, I just wanted to hopefully put on the spot really briefly um, one of our uh, COSA um, uh, affiliates, Could Natalie. You do that? No, I just asked him. Okay. Um, uh, and Natalie is a first year student here. And I was wondering if you wanted to just share any thoughts um, having heard that before we start um, closing as a group. Um, this whole unring thing is, of course, new to me. Um, but I find it, would, I'm really intrigued by it. I think it's a great way to go about grading, especially because I've been schooled in many non traditional ways. And I think grading can sometimes hinder the ability to learn with students. So I really enjoyed hearing about this. Um, I definitely think I've had a few more of my classes here talking about the problem. Um, we've been kind of working with a little bit of ungrading and I think communicating it with students a little bit more thoroughly is helpful because I was just thrown for a loop. It was, it was a very scary moment of <laughs> what is going on. Um, but I think it's definitely going to be something beneficial that really helps kids. Awesome. Can I um, just follow up with that? I think that is such a really important takeaway from all of this because that I felt like I had to be more explicit with my students about what my intentions were when I switched to ungrading. And what I then realized was I needed to be more explicit with my students about all of my intentions in the classroom. So it really le levered me into a conversation with students, a much more explicit conversation with students on a regular basis about like, this is why we're doing this, right? Like, this is why I've set up the class this way. Is this working for you? How could this work better for you? And again, like to go back to that kind of fear factor aspect of that, I think a lot of us just have anxiety about the notion that we expose because sometimes like we're just doing it because that's the way we do it. Like we don't know why we're doing it that way, that we have anxiety about how exposing our practices that way to our students. I have had nothing but positive experiences. That doesn't mean that all everything they say to me is easy to hear, but it always, always has led me to feel like I'm becoming a better teacher and I'm, and I'm working for my students better um, by having those explicit conversations. Yeah. I've wondered, sitting here, what this might look like for and with a primarily student audience. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about beyond just the classroom, like if we, if, if faculty are being oriented to ungrading as a philosophy and also sort of various ways of, and, and, and sort of acknowledging from the outset our anxieties mm -hmm. and experiences around giving grades, awarding grades, submitting grades, 
what would it be like to have a student <laughs> help students start a conversation about the philosophy around being graded? Mm -hmm. like, like, how do you orient yourself to ungradedness? Mm -hmm. like, like, not just as a thing that's done to you, obviously, because part of ungrading, it seems clear, is connected with open and, and a more, uh, more of a sort of reciprocal relationship. But I've just, I've wondered at several mm -hmm. points, like, what would this look like? Uh, obviously, in our classes, mm -hmm. on our syllabi, we want to communicate intentionality with students. But I, I keep coming back to the fact that to like feeling like little islands in an institution, yeah. mm -hmm. doing little things that pretend not to be grading until the, we give a grade mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, so, so true. Yeah. which is another sort of theater. Yeah. <laughs> but like, what if this happened, started happening among yeah. and for students, not just in a class, right. but like we are now. Yes. Mm -hmm. to, to connect to that, one thing that has helped moving the discussion down to earlier cohorts of students. Mm -hmm. I will have students who have previously taken the course come in to talk to the students and to share exemplars of work. So they know what the target is too, but they know that the target can look very different based on their own designs and their own knowledge and interests that they want to pull into it. So having the students talk to each other was very beneficial, mm. and the quality of their work really improved. So, 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 what, you, you, so I, just, I wanted to say thank you for sharing that, because as I'm doing this, I'm struggling with how do we address or cope with the developmental readiness mm -hmm. of not just our students for this, but also our institution. Mm -hmm. And then there's... <laughs> what week is this again? Our, in our institution is like toddler level. <laughs> <laughs> so sitting here like, okay, so six week grades are due. I gotta like, get back to my office yeah. and get grading mm -hmm. and convert all this yeah. to an A, B, C, or D. Yeah. Um, and then how do we also address some concerns around equity? Because as a student, I could see how I'm like, oh, well, that person did that and I did this and how does that end up playing out or distinguishing or being reflective for their success in the future? Mm -hmm. And also for faculty, so how does a faculty member who's being assessed in particular ways um, really make this a valid practice mm -hmm. that will be you know, acknowledged by whoever they're evaluating yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, there's, yep. there's some struggles there. And Matt's um, thing on the cruelty-free syllabus this summer provoked some really great conversation, and I was reading some follow-up stuff afterwards. I mean, there's some really you know interesting and problematic data out there about not so much open pedagogies, but things that involve things like ungrading, um, where there's real challenges in equity, not just like between two students, but how um, privilege factors into yeah. who is able to take advantage of yeah. systems yeah. that are less trans. Yeah. And it's, you know, we talk about these as very transparent systems because obviously the whole point of these in some ways is to be more transparent with students. Yeah. Um, but because of the way systems have trained students to understand things, that transparency can take some time to access. And so there's been some really interesting, there was a study, I can't remember what it was, but it came out around the, the summer because it was floating around at the same time as your thing that had some really disturbing um, sort of learning results about people who had tried pedagogies like this and the effect that it had on particularly students of color um, in their classrooms. And I thought that was really interesting. That was my exact mm -hmm. comment too, developmentally ready. I think it would take a lot of support for students to um, to know how to accept this because they know they know how to accept an 85. Mm -hmm. They've got experience accepting an 85. But my husband went to Northeastern Law School, which doesn't grade. They don't have rank, they don't have law review, they don't have any of the apparatus that goes with grades in most law schools. Instead, his transcript is this big wad of paper mm -hmm. with narrative comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they finally had to go to, with their co-op employers and future employers saying, well, excellent is better than very good. Right. And very <laughs> good is better than good. And so they, they had to end up with a, a, new, right, a yeah. new set of levels based yes. on verbal yes. uh, markers. Um, but our students wouldn't necessarily have that even. 
And I'm, my, my hesitation would be that since we're not telling them 85, um, especially around six week grade time, we, we yes. a few years ago voted to put, put six week grades in for all Everybody, students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, because, and that was meant to be a so. progressive thing to do, <laughs> yes. uh, though some people did vote against it. Not to, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> that was meant to be a progressive thing to do because being more right. you know, okay. overt and, and explicit about where we think people stand is, is supposed to be student supportive. Uh, my concern is that students without the 85 would fall back on their, uh, their baggage about authority. Mm -hmm. What does mm -hmm. my dad mean when he says that was good? Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> what does my mom yeah. mean when she says that was okay? You know what I mean? Like there's, they bring all sorts of stuff with them into the room mm -hmm. from their family, from their background, all kinds of places. And, and okay. so it would take, uh, I think, a lot of expertise, a lot of thought, a lot of work to know that we're not doing unintentional harm, harm or at least creating new barricades to them knowing where they stand that we didn't mm. see coming. Mm. Yeah. And that's, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, since we're ragging on six-week grades, like, I, I just have to, <laughs> I have to say, when, since I've gone open, like, I feel like I'm totally betraying their trust. Because I'm like, get in there and blog and post and try. And mistakes are good. We're learning from mistakes. And then I've had, like, a dozen students come up and go, what's the six-week grade thing? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be grading you. <laughs> You'll get a letter grade. And, I mean, I could just give everyone an A because, you know, who's trying? You know, you tried something, here's an A. But then I also have quizzes that aren't. I, don't, I have no idea how to ungrade my quizzes. But, um, you know, I do have real, you know, kind of grades. And then I have the majority of the work and all the good work they've done and all this, like, rich, like, experimentation and commenting on each other's blogs, like, the good stuff. I, I don't even know, like, what to put on the six-week grade for that. So it's... it's And they're supposed to have consequences, right? You talk right, to your advisor. Right. Maybe and, like, you, talk you to told us to and trust you. You told yeah. us you weren't grading. Now you're giving us six-week grade. Like, it's not me. It's the institution. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like maybe institutionally we also have to form little, like, rebel brigades and push back <laughs> the revolution, right? But say, well, I opt into six-week grades because I am giving letter grades, or I'm going open, so I, I promise by six weeks they'll have substantial feedback in a written narrative, right? Like, could I check one of those boxes, or I just have to give a letter? But but do you have to be the authority at the six-week grade mark? Can you, you have a whole week now mm -hmm. to open up a, a dialogue with the students mm -hmm. and, and maybe bring them in as participants? Mm -hmm. Give themselves six-week Right, but I mean that can, that self assessment is That's part of part of the right. part of the grade, right? But I mean, we've done in IDS so much self assessment, and you know, there some of the challenges. I mean, they won't surprise you, but they are, you know, not the ones people say you'll have. Like a lot of times, it's students very harshly judging themselves, right? I mean, there are. It's not. My experience is generally not like people get away with things with these models. It, it's they're. The issues are, I think, more complicated than than that, um, and also the slackers. They the slackers they slack, you know. Like it's, I don't find <laughs> that relevant to the conversation particularly. Yeah. Um, so but a saving grace of six week grades, I guess, is that they don't count. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. They right. don't. They go. They go away. They're, they're, they're not stay. part of your transcript. Right. They're not part of your right. transcript. They don't yeah. have to be part of your class. Yeah. You could right. almost formative assessment up those six-week grades yeah, yeah. pretty significantly, yeah. given how we use them, really. I will also say on that self-evaluation front that um, if you've never done that before, and th I mean, this is the way that I grade, and the last question on all of my self-evaluations is um, if you want to give yourself a grade, feel free to do that and tell me what you think it is. And what I always tell them is if I think there's a disconnect, right? Like if I think you've given yourself a grade, I'm not really seeing that we will then have a conversation. Um, you'll come in and talk to me, I'll find you, we'll discuss what's, where, what's happening with that disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I did this, my student self-evaluations, this sounds so corny, I actually cried reading them. Like, it was so cool to like see them reflecting upon these things in ways that were really like meaningful. Like it was really, really fun. They were fun to read. Like I looked forward to grading them. <laughs> Uh, which was sort of weird. Um, but the other piece of it is that almost always when it comes to the grade piece of it, it's female students giving themselves a lower grade than they've earned. Mm -hmm. um, and my feedback on self-evaluations is almost always positive and encouraging where they're saying, this is what I'm, this is how it's feeling for me. This is what I'm noticing. This is how I've developed. And I'm like, that's exactly what I've noticed. Here's what I've seen. Um, occasionally, 
it's them saying, I don't feel like I've done a really good job on this. And I'm like, are you crazy? You're like one of the most important members of our learning community. Um, and I could count on like one hand the number of times where a student has tried to like say they got an A and they haven't come to class for like five <laughs> weeks. And then it's really clear and you have a conversation with them and you say, look, let's talk about this. It's not that you can't fix this. It's not that I won't give you opportunities to do that, but we gotta be genuine with each other here. Um, I think a lot of people are scared of the whole idea of having your students grade themselves, but like it was transformative for me and it was not students trying to get away with stuff um, at all, yeah. I would back off of that. Um, what led me first to self-evaluations had nothing to do with anything of what we're really talking about here, but was that I kept telling students that grades are a form of communication. And what I realized that was that they communicated very differently to my students than to me. Yeah. Um, and so what I needed was to, to open up opportunities for conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started um, self-evaluations from, because I needed the information of what my students thought mm -hmm. so that I could then respond to that. And once I started doing that, it, um, then things got in place. Then I, I was still at that time really holding on to grades because I was at a place where I needed to. But then I began to see that gr the, the actual grade became less and less relevant because it was more about yeah. that conversation. And as long as the student and I were on the same page and had found a way to do that, then things were fine. It was when we were at totally different places that all the problems really showed their ugly heads. Um, I think in the interest of time, we just want to make sure are there any things, because pretty much everything that's been mentioned as a resource, everyone we've said we'll follow up on that, we'll put into this research page, which is why, like, normally if you attend a collab event, you'll get that resource page, like, that evening. That will not be the case with this one. We're going to build, a, to spend a little bit more time. Um, but so are there other things you'd like to see on there um, that we could collate together for you? This will be shared, you know, publicly, but we'll especially ping you. Um, I would say in an email as if I'm <laughs> keeping track of who's in this room, but we'll make sure we get it out. I guess I don't even know Can what this I I have this. looks like, but like that moment mm -hmm. or those moments of translating your ungrading into grading, mm -hmm. I would like to see some concrete examples mm -hmm. of that. Like mm -hmm. I, I get the philosophy, I don't mm -hmm. grade poems, like whatever, mm -hmm. but like there's always this moment mm -hmm. <laughs> right. of translation yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to put this up. Sue just returned this into the collab. Um, somebody else can check it out. We have in there a borrowing library, by the way. Um, there's one electrified bookcase that you can't touch, and then there's one borrowing library that you can't touch. This is in the borrowing library, so if someone wants to take it. but um, it, So we'll put that together. Uh, I'm including a couple of resources, but some will be from Star Saxteen. Mm -hmm. Because she's um, K-12 in a like traditional public school, mm -hmm. basically. Can you and stop moving it so I can read this? Went, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she went um, ungraded and a, uh, has um, helped a lot of people do it in very, very traditional environments. So I used a ton of her stuff. I read it on a plane. It was like a two-hour flight. And when I get out, got off, then we ungraded IDS. With, like, with, <laughs> because it's very <laughs> instrumental um, and instructive. Right, so. but... But about there just your thing. There are grades. There are grades okay, so in her institution. The, the disconnect yeah. I want yeah. to yeah. So that she, moment. What she would say is we are ungraded inside of a fully graded environment, yeah. including dealing also in that book with um, parents mm -hmm. yeah. when you're going to give grades at the very end. So it's, it's what she's really doing is living in between those two worlds, right? The world of formative assessment and then a stru institutional structure that's totally traditional. Is there any research or literature or an article that could transform my life and save the day, uh, which would address um, people like me who are not completely ungrading, so I still have quizzes and exams that are graded, and I have all this juicy, wonderful stuff that's ungraded, because I feel like sometimes there's a philosophical clash there, <laughs> you know, like, go experiment, but you better know the information for this quiz, right? So I need help kind of, can we do both? Like, you, you suggested it's okay to, but then I feel like I'm not being genuine. Yeah, question. great question. We can follow up on that too with more more resources. Anything else people are, questions that you'd like or kinds of resources that would be helpful to you as you explore this further? Self-reflection questions? Yeah, for so models. Models, yeah. like what are good questions for that? Did, did you say something? Prompts for self-reflection. Prompts, yeah. prompts and models. Yeah. I'd love to learn more about the ungraded exams. Okay. Yeah. 
Does anyone already have an idea of brewing? You do? Yeah. What's your idea? Um, well, I, the, um, I have a class in particular that I think I could probably do ungraded exams with because it's very, I, I, I teach in primarily, it's an accredited program in healthcare, so we have some hard, you know, criteria by which we need to measure our students, but this one class is um, very process oriented mm -hmm. in that there's a lot of right ways to do things, yeah. but I think um, using kind of an ungraded approach and how I assess their process, their process might be more appropriate than what I'm doing right now. I'm not sure how that will look yet, but. And I, that makes me wonder if that, that would help with, like I, I know we dropped some quotes on your table, but the, the big one to remember when you are providing feedback um, is to, to provide process-oriented feedback and not so much feedback that's person-based. Mm -hmm. So getting away from you mm -hmm. are doing good or you are, it's mm -hmm. this is what I noticed in your work. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm seeing in your work. Um, this is the type of progress I've noticed in your work. Um, this is how you have, and I don't even want to say you, but um, I noticed you added this to our discussion today. Those types of, it's about the process of learning and that you're noticing what they're learning. And hopefully by providing some of that language in your feedback, you start to see that in their self-evaluations. Mm -hmm. I contributed this. Mm -hmm. um, I did bring a resource for those of you who are, who are teaching um, tackling a wicked problem. And if you're working with small groups a lot, because they're on teams, to help them think about, do I have a fixed frame? Is this about me as a learner? Or is my frame more dynamic? Do I understand that learning is changeable? Mm -hmm. I can fix this, I can grow. So I do have a resource for that. Well, that is great, and maybe just by way of closure, I'll remind you that we have this webinar in February, and one thing that I would really appreciate besides anybody coming on the team who wants to be part of it is um, we're not re it's not really for this group. It's actually for a much wider USNH group, and so this is a, in some ways a test run for us, and what would really be helpful is you know, here's the stuff I would never change. I, like this was what we really needed and this was awesome. We could have had a little more of this, a little less of this, because that's actually going to be similarly about an hour and a half. The webinar software, we're using Zoom, but we're using Zoom webinar. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a little bit less interactive. Um, it has Q and A, um, but not so much like groups or discussion time. But if you can just kind of think about that and feel free to shoot me an email, I would super appreciate it because you know, I didn't see this through your eyes. So whatever you have um, by way of um, help with us designing that for February. And if you'd like to be on the team, which really, it's gonna, it's an evening webinar at seven. So if you're on the team, you can hang out here in the collab. We'll have pizza, we'll have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I think it'll be really fun. And you don't have to be on camera. Like you could just be part of the planning and the hanging out in the conversation. So thank you all for coming. And thank you so much, Martha and Sue for doing this.